Hi, it's Robin. Welcome to another episode of 8-Bit Show and Tell. I'm recording this episode just before Christmas, and that means it's winter time here in Canada. So I thought to celebrate, I had written a little program here. I'm just going to start it up. Now I realize I'm not going to be able to cut out all my ums and ahs and everything because uh, you're going to see the snowflakes jump every time I do that. But anyway, <laughs> I thought I'd try that just for the intro. This is a little routine I wrote that's interrupt driven. It basically it's generating uh, it's generating these snowflakes each time it falls. A new one is randomly built, and they're cheating. It's like uh, quad quad flakes. My friend Darren called them because they're not six sided; they're four sided. But basically, uh, one quarter is randomly generated, and then they're mirrored and flipped uh, to produce the other sides. But I was surprised by how interesting some of the patterns are. And apologies to my friends in Australia, who uh, snow has nothing to do with Christmas there. Uh, they're going to have to just enjoy their, their beach barbecues and the Boxing Day test match, which I'll be watching from here in Canada. Looking forward to that. Okay, back in the first episode of 8-Bit Show and Tell, we took a look at all the error messages in C64 Basic, all 32 of them. One oddity with the error messages is how there were two spaces between the name, like the main name of the error, and the word error itself. So, you know, if I just type in whatever, twice pies, okay, and you go up here and there's two spaces between the syntax and error. And now even stranger is there is a break error, and I think the only way you can get that is by doing a disk access that you interrupt. So I'm going to start it and press the stop key immediately. And here, break one, two, three spaces between break and error. My friend Megervalp uh, noticed that while he was watching the first episode, and we were both surprised. Why are there three spaces in that one? And now this, this is an aside, but notice that the break error is different than the regular break you see. Like if you run, write a little program like uh, 10, go to 10, and you run it, it's just an endless loop, and you press stop, it tells you there is a break in 10. But notice that's not a break error. And another way you can generate a break is by stopping a program listing in progress. And that got me thinking of this little aside here. I'm going to write new. Let's try to think, what is the longest program that I can write that generates a long listing, but as few keystrokes as possible? You might know that when you're typing on a Commodore 64, only some keys auto-repeat, like the cursor keys automatically repeat, the space bar automatically repeats, but something like a question mark does not automatically repeat. You have to press it each time. If you hold it down, it doesn't repeat. There's actually a poke where you can change that. Poke 650, comma 128, and now it'll auto-repeat. Okay, so using that, you don't have to do that, but this is just to generate the new program. So I'm just going to go new, zero, and the longest program listing you can easily, quickly generate that I know of is filling a whole line, two columns, uh, 80 characters, with a line number and then 79 question marks, which will be expanded into prints after. And they can just keep cursoring up and typing a new line number and hitting return after each one. Okay, there, I've made a program listing, or I've made a program, and let's list it. So I think that's about four or five screens worth of prints. <laughs> now, of course, that program doesn't work. If you tried to run it, it'd just give you a syntax error. Maybe that's, that's not the point. Uh, the whole reason I'm doing this, sorry, this is quite a diversion, is to, when you list, and you can press stop, there you go, break, and ready. 
And I just want to show that's another way of getting a break that is not a break error. It just says break. I also noticed that the Commodore 64 only seems to check for the, pre for the stop key being hit at the end of printing each line. So actually, if you go list, if you tap it, it often won't respond unless it happens to be printing the very end of a line while you're holding it down. So I was able to, let's see here. You see it's ignoring the stop key. It's not because my keyboard's faulty. If I hit list and then just hold it down, it will stop as soon as it's done printing one of these massive lines. So you can't uh, break a listing midline, and normally it doesn't matter at all, but when you're printing ridiculous, ridiculously long lines like this, then you really notice it. Okay, that's totally a diversion. Okay, so today we're going to be looking at these two errors. Why? What is the cause of the two spaces? And also, even more interesting to me, why are there three spaces in a break here? That's what we're going to be looking at. But first, let's go to... I've got my Atari 2600 Junior set up here. This is a later cost-reduced version of the Atari 2600. It's smaller. I actually find them a little bit more reliable. So far on 8-bit show and tell, I've just been showing Commodore machines. In fact, almost just the C64, C128. But I love all sorts of 8-bit machines. Atari 2600. I love this console. So we got a little bit of a Christmas winter theme going on here. So I'll show you this game, Toy Shop Trouble. It's not so new. <laughs> it was actually released originally in 2006, and I got one of the original run. I got number... 74 but i'm bringing this up because it still is available a new um an unlimited version of it is available on the atari age store i'll put a link to atari age and if you have an atari 2600 this is a fantastic game it's definitely my favorite christmas themed game but it's just actually one of my all-time favorite atari 2600 games so let's give it a try uh, by the way today i'm playing with my Starfighter joystick. It's like a brother to the TAC-2 and the Slick Stick. It's a decent little joystick and what a cool name. So here we are, main title screen, Toy Shop Trouble. It's got pretty good music for an Atari 2600 game. You're this little elf, Santa's helper. You gotta uh, paint all the toys. So the first level is really easy. You just grab the red paint over here and you paint all the fire trucks. You finish the level. You have to hold down the fire button uh, actually paint something that also increases your speed. Now you got these trumpets that have to be painted yellow and yellow is over on this side of the screen and you have to go grab red. And so this game is very much about optimization, about management. It gets more and more complicated the more toys that arrive. So now there's these green, uh, I guess Godzilla that you got to tag red. You can do them in any order you want. There's a time limit. If you accidentally paint one the wrong color, no problem. You just go paint it the right color. It's called, it's a very modern design in a lot of ways. It's not nearly as punishing as a lot of Atari 2600 games. It has an excellent uh, little display at the top that actually gives you some tips as you play. Uh, if you're having trouble, if you move on top of something, it tells you what color it should be painted. Now there's these ADATs from Star Wars. And you see down at the bottom of each screen it says the, uh, the day. And you're working from December 1st, presumably until December 24th. I've never gotten there. The best I've ever done is December 21st, which happens to be today when I'm filming this. Okay, and this is the first uh, combination item. This candy cane requires red and white paint. And you can do that in whatever order you like. Grab yellow. Whoops. I obviously didn't get the white paint that I thought I was getting there. 
And that last candy cane just needs some red. So I also love the controls in this game. There uh, is a great sense of acceleration, velocity. It's not frustrating, it just makes it fun. It's very responsive. Um, and like I was saying, the problem solving, uh, the, the puzzle, the planning aspect of it. It's not so much a puzzle game as a planning game where you have limited time and you gotta make the most of every second. And uh, I just find it extremely compelling. Uh, I just, I've just i been playing this game over and over again. I've been mean to record this episode for a few days now, and I find myself just standing here playing this game instead. So... And then later on in the game, it gets even more complicated. Uh, where you actually have to paint things in the correct order. First, you have to put down, say, yellow paint on a truck, then black for the tires. You have to do it in the correct order. Okay, so that's Toy Shop Trouble. Even if this game doesn't sound interesting to you, if you have an Atari 2600, Atari Age publishes so many fantastic new Atari 2600 games. While this, this scene started up in the late 90s, people starting to make Atari 2600 games on their own, and it continues today. There's just uh, always new Atari 2600 games coming out. Check through their web shop. There might be something you like there. Big shout out to Albert there, uh, who I've met a couple times uh, years ago in Milwaukee. And he's a fantastic guy. Very friendly. Okay, I'm back at my 128D here. And I've got my um, the 128D that we set up last week. I've got my Super Snapshot cartridge plugged in today. I'm going to be using that as we figure out what's going on with these spaces. Super Snapshot might not be all that well known to some people. The Action Replay seems like it's more popular. They're very similar cartridges. Uh, I actually own a Retro Replay as well, which is a remake. Well, when it was the late 80s and I heard about these utility cartridges, it was the Super Snapshot I got because it was Canadian made. Very similar in functionality. I think the only reason people prefer one over the other is that they got used to the particular UI and nuances of that cartridge. It's, uh, I don't think anybody can make a convincing case that one is way better than the other one. So I'm just going to hit the button on my Super Snapshot cartridge. It freezes the computer. And then from the menu, I can go in through monitors and ML monitor, machine language monitor. And here we are in Code Inspector version 5 from 1990. And what we're doing is looking for that error message and using various disassemblies and so on. That string exists at A369. So you see right here, when you use the M command, it shows you what is in memory at that location, 8 bytes at a time. And here you can see the string error. It's actually got two spaces proceeding at. Hex 20 is the pet ski for a space. And then this is the pet ski for the word error. Actually, if we scroll down, it automatically shows more. Let's try that again. A369. You can see other text over here at the right. So on the left are the bytes that are actually in memory. Okay, so there's the text. And... It appears that the spaces are built right in. Bizarre. So it seems like it's a deliberate thing. We'll look at the code here. So now I'm using the D, which is a disassemble command at location A450. And you scroll down. And right here, that same address I was just talking about, A3. 6, 9. It's split up because the Commodore 64 has an 8-bit processor. When you want to deal with 16-bit memory addresses, you have to split it up into two pieces. So the 69 is what we call the low byte, and the A3 is the high byte, and they're loaded into the A and Y registers. And then we jump to subroutine AB1E, which prints a string, a null, a zero terminated string. So right here, this is the code that actually prints that string of error with two spaces in it. 
Okay, so I'm just going to make a note. This location right here, A465, and, and actually the byte after it, A466, contains the 69 byte. So I suspect that just by increasing the 69 to a 6A, we would actually have the string print one byte later, and then it would just show only the one space. Okay, we'll try that later. Now how about the three spaces in the break error? Most of the error messages, A1, are stored in this area at A19E. So I'm just disassembling it here. And you see over on the right, here are all the various error messages. Too many file heart, file op, and then a slash, file not op, e, slash. And so what you'll notice is that these strings aren't zero or null terminated. They actually have a strange character at the end of each one where you would expect like too many files. That should be an S. Instead, there's a heart there. Now, if we look at the hex code, this is the Petsky for the word file, F-I-L-E. And then here, instead of being in the 40 or 50 range, it's way up in the D range, D3. And what they've done is set the high bit to flag that the string is over. So all these strings are kind of slightly compressed. Instead of wasting a byte for a zero at the end of each one, Instead, they're saying the high bit because they don't need the full 256 values. So there's all those error messages in a large block. So there's a routine at A43A. And what this routine does is it's called with the X register set to the error number, which is then multiplied by two when you shift it to the left. And then values are loaded in from here, A326 and A327. There's a big table of pointers to all these strings that are loaded and then stored into location 22 and 23. And then down here, we have a loop that loads each of those string values and stores the value, chops off the high bit, prints the character and then returns and it's looking here for the high bit branch if plus it loops back to a456 if the high bit is not set but if it is set then it continues on that terminates the string so basically this is a, a routine that just prints one of these error messages okay so this this is what we usually call just like a, a pointer table or a, a, a table A326. And so what's going on here is each of these values is pointing to one of those strings. So the, it's always in low byte and then high byte format. So this, these two combined are A19E. I'm not sure what error message zero is. It points to C, C441. So presumably error message zero is an invalid error message. C441. So we just skip that. But here, A19E. And let's look at A19E. Okay, so that's the too many files error. And then next over here, A1AC. A1, A, C is the file open error message and so on. But if we scroll through all these, so you'll have to trust me that break does not appear in this long list. There just is no break here. Okay, so where is the break string? It's actually even further down. We keep going. And there's a little bit more text over here. Error in. And here's the ready prompt. And here we go. Break. 
And now we'll notice that the break error actually ends with a zero. So what's going on? We've got most of the error messages in a big table that are terminated by having their high bit set. The break message actually is zero terminated. Commodore have included it here, A356. Here we're near the end of that uh, table of all the various error messages. And you see we have A30, A30E, A31E, kind of just creeping up, A324. But then there's this fairly big jump to A383, and that's the break error message. So what, what they've done is, I think there was already the text for break here. That was a normal null terminated string. And Commodore tacked it on to the end as if it was just another error message, which should have had its high bit set, but it doesn't. And that is the cause of this bug. So let's take a look at that break string again, A383. And you see it ends with a zero. And then what does it end with? It has this A0. And I looked at a whole bunch of disassemblies online. I believe five different disassemblies. And four of them had no comment at all about why this A0 is here. And the last one just said it was unused. Well, it's not unused. It's actually part of the bug. When the routine that prints the error, that is the one that expects high bits to be set, is going through this, it prints the word break just fine, then hits the zero. And you might think that this prints the blank space, but no, it doesn't. When this zero is printed, it actually just prints nothing. The cursor doesn't move at all. Not, it doesn't even print a space. The cursor stays just where it is. Then it hits this A0, which actually happens to be 20, which is a space with the high bit set. So that's A0. So actually this A0 is used. It prints a space and then terminates the string. I realize that this is a more difficult thing for me to explain than some of the basic stuff I've been doing previously. So I hope I explain that. But I think this, what I'm about to do now, will help this be more understandable. So actually I'm going to go back into the monitor. By the way, you can just hit the M as a shortcut right into the monitor here. And I just want to note that break string with the zero and that a zero the memory location for that is a three eight nine so because this is the byte that actually prints the extra space that we don't want i think changing this to a eight zero which will print nothing again instead would actually be the solution okay so let's try to actually fix this now. I think we've figured out the location and causes of it. An interesting thing about the C64 that the VIC-20 and the PET couldn't really do easily is that the C64, you can actually patch the basic and kernel quite easily because of the 64K of RAM that the 64 has. Like the basic and the kernel ROMs are sharing memory space, but you can actually switch them in and out. When I'm talking, I often say the C64, I'm programming in 6502 assembly. But of course, really the C64 actually has, oh, and of course I'm actually using a 128D today, but it's in C64 mode. The C64 actually has a 6510 processor, which is completely equivalent to 6502, except that it has an IO port, an input output port, at location zero M1. And that is what controls the memory configuration where you can switch RAM or ROM in and out. You can actually write a simple little program like this, or not even a program, a one-liner, 40960 to 40960 plus 8191 and 
poke x comma peak x and next we'll let that run and while it's running i'll just explain it now the loop is copying eight kilobytes that eight one nine one is well one byte short of eight kilobytes eight thousand one hundred ninety two bytes and that's the size of basic rom and so all this loop is doing is it's peaking location x and then poking it back into the same spot but the poke actually goes through into ram so now what we've done is duplicated a copy of rom in the ram underneath it and now we're going to switch over and tell the 64 poke one comma peak one and 254 okay and there's no apparent change but now the commodore is using a copy of basic not in rom but in ram and now we can actually patch it so we'll do a regular syntax error again so i'll just type in <laughs> okay so now i'll generate a syntax error dang okay i couldn't figure out what was going on wrong i tested this earlier turns out the problem I, I had to go have a sandwich break came back and now i know it's the super snapshot causing the problem here i actually have to disable it i'm going to press f8 here this disables the super snapshot it's probably one of the various little hook-ins like the uh the wedge it uses the various changes it makes to basic probably don't play nice with what i'm trying to do here so super snapshot is still plugged in and it's still accessible the cart with the cartridge button but all the other functions of it are currently disabled and i'm going to try that again <laughs> okay and now we're going to poke location one which is that input output register with its own value but ended with 254 what that's going to do is mask out or zero the low bit which controls whether the c64 sees basic in location a thousand that is this 40960 and so we're just going to cause a syntax error and you see this time it didn't crash and it has the two spaces in it oh and and while we're at it i'll do the break error here and you see it has three spaces in it okay so now what i'm going to do is poke 42086 comma 106 okay and all that is is well might as well just take a look again okay so we're just going to take a look at that code So this is where we're loading in value, where we're going to point to the string at A369. This is what prints the error message, A369. Okay, there's the error text with the two spaces in front. So this value right here, we want to change from 69, and we want to point one later to 6A, so it only prints one space. So what is that? Let's type in A466. That's the location of it. And it shows in decimal the value we're going to want to poke to 42086. So take note of that. And we want the 69 to increase to 6A. So that we're going to point at the next value. So that's a 6A. So basically we're going to poke 42086 comma 106 okay so let's exit back to basic and here we are poke 42086 comma 106 okay nothing seems to have happened let's try and generate a syntax error 
Look at that. Only one space. And what happens when we do a break error? Now there's only two spaces in the break error. And now we're going to try that fix for the extra space after a break. So again, we'll look at the monitor here. So A3, there's break. That's this byte in particular that we want to change, which I believe is A389. Yep, there it is. That's the A0. And we want to change that. We want to clear the high bit of that. So A0 is currently 160, but instead we want to just change that to hex 80 with the high bit set. Location A389 is 41865. So we're going to want to poke 41865, 128. So let's do that. Poke. 41865, 128. And let's see. Syntax error still works with just one space. Let's try that again. Break, stop, break, error. And look, it only has one space in it. So we've patched it and we've solved those bugs. Not that they were very serious or important bugs, but. It was mostly a curiosity. And now while we're in here, since we've got the basic ROM in RAM right now, we can change anything we want. For example, just going back into the monitor here. A3. Okay, so for example, at A378, you see here is the word ready. And A378 is location 41848. And we can change that to another value if we want. So let's go ahead and do that. Poke 41848, comma, 72. Changes the ready into heady. And we can keep going here. There we go. Syntax error fixed and the ready prompt has been changed into a hello prompt. I'm doing this particular one because Jim Butterfield kind of famously in his uh, Commodore 64 instructional training video, uh, he showed this little hack and used the word hello. And he also changed the syntax error into an idiot error, I believe. So. I'll link to that old uh, YouTube video. Actually, that video is partly an inspiration for what I'm doing here. Uh, at one point, I even considered trying to uh, be on camera the same way Jim was and wear a little uh, sports jacket or something. And anyway, <laughs> it was a bit of a challenge for me uh, figuring out how to explain this. I found it a lot more difficult to clearly communicate than the basic, but I hope you got the idea of it. I hope you still learn something. Actually, I think there's an interesting history behind both of these bugs uh, in how the basic and kernel of the various Commodore machines changed over the years, starting with the PAT, a couple revisions there, then the VIC-20, then the C64, then the C128. I want to walk through that history and I'll do a little bit of uh, detective work, try to figure out why these bugs happened and when. But this episode's gone long enough already, so I'm going to save that for another episode. It's going to involve me hooking up my PET and my VIC-20 and putting those on camera here for the first time. So, thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed already, please do. And also hit that little bell notification so that you know when I release a new episode. And if you are celebrating the Christmas holiday season, I wish you and your, your family the very best. And I wish you a very Commodore 64 Christmas. We'll see you next time.
was December 1982 I hoped that my dream would come true That there would be waiting for me A Commodore computer under the tree I want a Commodore 64 Christmas Lego's nice, Lego's fine, but it won't scratch this 8-bit itch of mine. It was December 1983, what would Santa bring for me? Would I finally get my wish, my very own computer with a SID chip? Commodore 64 Christmas I wanted and I got a Commodore 64 Christmas